All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are in the home stretch here. Just an hour to go before we head up on flights and, and wrap up the conference. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the roundtables uh, earlier, gave you a chance to maybe talk a bit more intimately uh, on subjects near and dear to you. Um, our, our last session, as, as you can see by the comfy chairs, is, is meant to be more of a kind of fireside chat. You know, we're, we're, it's going to be a Q&A, hopefully quite interactive between all of us, uh, and that, inc that includes you. Um, let me just, again, as usual, start with a little bit of housekeeping. It's just quite important because I think so far we haven't gotten many back. Uh, on your tables, you'll see evaluation forms, uh, feedback forms. There is uh, a, very, a nice bottle of champagne and, and I think a box of spices for the winner. We will we'll draw a name out of a hat or out of a, out, of a, out of a box later. So over the course of this session, please take time to fill those in and uh, we'll collect them uh, towards the end of, of the session and, and do that. Uh, just also another note that um, Geert Brunel from, from Volvo car, he has to leave here around quarter to four, I believe. So uh, maybe, some, maybe, maybe you want to direct some of your questions to him first. Uh, and then obviously, you know, don't be surprised when, when he has to get up and we'll, we'll, we'll let him go so he doesn't miss his flight. Okay. Um, let me sort of ease us into this, I guess. You know, I think one of... One of the objectives for uh, the conference for us this year was, was to challenge the industry a little bit. You know, rather than maybe just focusing on, on lots of subjects which you already know uh, and, and do every day, uh, we wanted to get a bit of outside perspective, whether it was from e-commerce or, or the car design world, as you, as you heard last night, and, 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 and a bit more looking at future trends, what's happening more broadly in both the automotive industry and also in the automotive supply chain. And then, of course, connect that back to what it means uh, for logistics. Over the course of the past two days, on, on some levels, this might have even seemed a little bit scary. Um, obviously, uh, in the economic sense, we know that there's growth, but it's hardly what you might call a boom. Uh, it's quite varied. It's, it's stagnant. Uh, we're looking at geopolitical risks in, in Europe that we haven't seen for, for 20, 25 years. Um, and uh, there's a lot of un unanswered questions, as we, as we know, in the macroeconomic side. And then looking at the automotive industry, there's a lot of change which, which might be very disruptive, whether it's young people showing more interest in, in their mobile phones than in cars, or, or indeed the, the, the car sharing or the drop of ownership, uh, what the automated vehicle will mean to vehicle ownership, what it will mean to how a car is built, uh, what it will mean to the actual suppliers that supply that or change or, or disappear altogether. Uh, with 3D printing or a car that can diagnose, uh, can diagnose itself, maybe even repair itself with software, what that means for dealers and the aftermarket. Um, and, and indeed, what happens when internet companies get even more involved uh, in, in this industry. You know, there seemed to be a, a looming question uh, if you really want to be dark and existential about, uh, you know, whether parts of the industry won't, won't, won't be looking like a Kodak or, uh, or a beautiful vinyl record, which is, a, is an artifact but isn't so useful anymore in the next uh, 10, 15 years. Um, I don't personally think that's, that's what's going to happen, but I think that's, you know, part of, part of what we needed to throw out. If, if for nothing else, to, to sort of challenge people to, to think, that, think that's through. What's, because... That technology, automated vehicles, as I was speaking to someone earlier, this is not in the future. You know, the technology is already here. Our panel this morning unanimous, unanimously agreed that the first thing will be an automated commercial vehicle, probably within a plant or, or a truck, even before the, the, uh, the, the personal car. So this is, this is in the industry that, that we're working in, and this is not uh, the distant future. Those of you who are Back to the Future fans will note that it's 2015, and we don't have a flying car, and we're not going to, but certainly the automated car. That looks to be just around the corner. Uh, so we're kind of left asking ourselves, as I think someone put it yesterday, are we, are we, are we building the systems and, and the assets and investing in, in the answers to tomorrow's, oh, sorry, to yesterday's problems rather than, rather than tomorrow's? Um, so that's kind of where I wanted to kick off our, our discussion. Um, and I'll give our panel a little bit of time to think about that because I Actually, I should introduce them first. That would, be, that would actually be the polite thing to do uh, before I ask them to uh, such an existential question. You, you will have seen some of them already. 
Uh, but um, you know, we have a great VIP panel here, starting at your left, Andreas Ginkel from, from Opel, Geert Brunel from Volvo Car, Guy Lederet from PSA Peugeot Citroën, and Carlos Lajos from, from Kia. And of course, uh, you might notice now that I'm all grown up, Louis is, is letting me take, take over a few more things. You could say he's giving me the keys to the car, but now that the cars drive themselves, I'm not really sure that that, <laughs> that metaphor applies anymore. Uh, so Louis and I are kind of sharing the, the, this, this questionnaire, so it's meant, it's meant to be a discussion that we'll both, we'll both get involved in uh, as well as you. So of course Louis is, is, is joining the panel there too. So to, to our panel, um, are, is the logistics of your providers in your supply chain, are we prepared for the future that's coming? Or are we focused more on the tactical, operational, firefighting issues of today? Um, whether that means prepare for a self-driving car or whether that means enough innovation or enough critical thinking or enough uh, interaction from an intelligence from your suppliers, that, I leave that to you. But just to, to throw us out there, and then I'm going to come join them on the comfy chairs because it's, it's much more comfy. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we can start with Andreas. Yeah, you know, what I was just thinking is that between now and 2060, so there is still some time. And uh, you, the question you were raising was, are we, are we just trying to close gaps with fixing problems of the past, or are we preparing the future? And I guess it is, it is kind of both. And I, I'm a strong believer that the nucleus of both is a mindset that, need, that needs to comprehend the following. The first thing is, the mindset shift needs to be, we want to manage that complexity. We want to manage that challenge. We do not want to, sh to shy away because it is complicated, it is complex. It requires innovation. It requires that we change. Um, what I find frustrating is if, if we are talking the same type of problem since 20 years and still complain, there is not enough uh, forecast is not accurate, schedules are volatile, and you are running sourcings. Well, yes, we will run sourcings. Schedules are volatile. The forecasts are sometimes inaccurate, and I tell you what, to some degree, we are all influencing that. Manage it. Help us managing that complexity and let us get together with the huge innovation and intelligence that is in this industry which some of intelligence that is in our industry, let us get together and let us have these um, organization, people, process that can talk about who needs to do what in that end-to-end -end chain to manage that complexity, to have a complete and entire customer focus and to work based on total enterprise cost. And in so far, the nucleus of the past and the future is the same. It's all about exactly that mindset. Uh, I, I fully uh, agree, Andres, Rias, what you are saying, uh, because I, I think also that when we talk about assets and uh, people, process, and technology has been in focus uh, during these two days, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really to handle the complexity. And uh, we should not underestimate, uh, we have today already complex processes and, and systems, but this will uh, increase exponentially uh, um, with the volume, with the variance, with the legislation. Uh, uh, and, and in particular with the globalization, I think this is, uh, this is really a uh, big difference uh, for the coming five years, I believe, what we, uh, what we will see. I do believe that uh, when it comes to these assets, that uh, people are most uh, critical. Uh, I, I, um, I think we have talked about the competence, development, talent, and so on. It will be uh, more than ever crucial to have the right person in the right place. Um, I also think that in complex situations, uh, we can help ourselves to use simple principles. Uh, because we need, to, uh, we need to make sure that, uh, that we still uh, uh, can manage it uh, and can, uh, if we talk about change management, that we still can engage people and, and uh, really make sure that everybody understands the, the changes that are required. So I think also simple principles uh, are, are very important. Uh, uh, like uh, think global, act local, uh, the, uh, produce where you sell and, and source where you, where you produce. I, I think there are a couple of key principles I think that you as, as a company has to make, uh, uh, has, to, has to decide what kind of uh, 
company do you want to be and what you want to achieve? I think it's, uh, it's, very, uh, it's very crucial. And, and I must say from, from my perspective, from Volvo Cars, we have, a clear, uh, we have a clear strategy that we want to manage the supply chain or the value chain uh, ourselves. There is no discussion about that. Uh, uh, it's, uh, we, we see logistics as, uh, uh, as part of our core activities. Well, uh, I, I fully agree uh, with you, uh, Gerd. That that's uh, that's for sure. Maybe two two points to to, to a little complement on that. Um, the, the first one is that uh, is the speed. We maybe not exactly know what will be the changes, but the only thing I'm sure that we'll have to react very quickly, and that, as you mentioned, is uh, the, the 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 competency and the people and the capacity to to to, to achieve a global and, and common uh, goal. That's the first point, and it's especially true for uh, outbound logistics, since there we're having in front of us a new way of distributing vehicles. And this is, uh, for me, the next revolution in the next years. What will be exactly? Don't know. But the only way of, uh, of, of avoiding being Kodak altogether <laughs> for LSPs is to, uh, is to go quickly to the understanding of these movements. Well, um, in my opinion, I mean, Kia, but also Hyundai Kia Group, it is a, it is a new... Um, a pretty new uh, competitor in the in the European market. So we, when when we see Opel, Volvo, or PCA, I mean they, they have been here forever. I mean the the, the home country it is Europe. Mm -hmm. So when when ASEAN companies they came to to Europe, they they have no infrastructures, they have no providers, they have nothing. So basically the um, Toyota, Honda, Mazda, and Hyundai Group they just got and unify everything, so single compound, single uh, port of entries, uh, uh, easy ways of doing things and distributors in order to, to, to establish first the infrastructure. So basically now the, these, um, you know, let's say um, outside companies, then we developed and we started to create infrastructures, we created factories, um, and now a, a big part of our production and our sales in Europe comes from European sources from European uh, factories. So basically, we 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 were at, at a certain time uh, the, the new kids on the block, and now we we are trying to evolution and and, and get into that direction. So from ourselves, we did not count with the know-how in supply chain and infrastructure like the established companies. So we needed. On, on one hand, is pretty complex because you, can, you you make a lot of mistakes. On the other, on, on the second hand. Um, you can experiment, you can do things different, you can question things in a different way, right? So um, I guess you know that Hyundai and, and, and Kia, we have a, a pretty vertical approach. So the, the owners of the company, you know, they, they, they own, uh, you know, a steel company, a steel factories, and we have a, a known company, Globis, which handling, you know, the, the, the infrastructure and the logistics in Euros and give us <coughs> service in all of that. But in order for them to, to understand how they better can adapt to our needs, we need to know very clearly where we want to go. So, so the, the business model, any investment and infrastructure that we want to do in the future, we need to know very, very clearly where we want to arrive. So this is, uh, as Gerd was saying, so this is our future engineering of the supply chain and this is what we're going to need and then work together in order to, to arrive to then optimize. So um, in, I think in uh, what I've seen from, from my perspective, it is that the, the, uh, the industry develops a bit more slower than I would like. You know, there is discussions uh, go over and over for years and, and you, you always have the same discussions around. So it doesn't seem that it is a very clear solution, mm. a very clear, very quickly fix. Um, and and I, I would like as a customer, as a client, to, to, to find the supply chain more dynamic. Mm. Uh, from, from at least that's what we demand, being very, very quick in the response. Maybe if I can add to that, uh, because a couple of times so that already have we been talking about lean uh, and, and uh, yeah, is this uh, good or bad or is, what is that and is that applicable for logistics? Uh, uh, I, I must say uh, I'm coming from a different background, so my, my background is very much uh, manufacturing and production. 
and, and uh, I think it's uh, I can recommend it to to change uh, area sometimes because uh, you you looked with other eyes to to, uh, to a certain uh, process. Uh, my opinion is that uh, uh, when it, when I look to inbound and outbound, there is there is uh, still a lot of uh, waste el to be eliminated. Eh? Uh, I think lean, uh, I think, is also, that, is also a misunderstanding. Lean is to create value for our customers. Of course, if you eliminate waste, you, you increase your share of added value. Uh, but, but it's really customer in focus and uh, take away the unnecessary uh, uh, activities or process. And I'm, I must say, uh, from my perspective, uh, uh, compared to in-plant production, uh, there's a, a big gap. Uh, of uh, excellence, uh, operational excellence, and I, it's certainly something that uh, just uh, that's why I'm saying it. Uh, I think also we, we need to uh, we need to uh, make sure that we take advantage of the technolog technological uh, development, but at the same time we should not forget the daily operations and, and drive improvements uh, that uh, we can do with uh, with processes, with people, and uh, and it is there is still. Uh, a big, uh, a big uh, potential, I must say, in that respect. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I think both from a uh, flow efficiency to, to create a continuous flow, seamless flow, without interruption, uh, with a perfect sequence, high build to order, and, and at the same time also to have a high resource efficiency. The flow and resource efficiency together, uh, I think, is, a, is, a, is the lean concept, uh, which I think is very much applicable in, in inbound and outbound. Can uh, I catch that ball for a second? <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> we just now had a, a, a discussion, a bit of a provocative discussion in our think tank type of thing here. And um, <clears throat> that probably illustrates it and it makes it very tangible what it is that we are probably talking about. So the discussion was, you know, there's this one complaint about um, um, the OEMs are going out sourcing and the best price wins, let's assume, for an ocean container. This container costs 2,900, the other container costs 3,000, and hence the OEMs all go for that cheaper ocean container. Well, the, the challenging thought we brought into the scene was, um, if you guarantee me, guys, if you step up to manage the materials management of that country of origin, Though that, that container is utilized not by 60% but by 90% because you comprehend that the values that are sitting here with these four only might be two billion every year. So you helping us utilizing an ocean container from 60 to 100% just as a provocative mathematical kind of point of view, that is 800 million. Hmm. That is 800 million we can help ourselves saving. And yes, it has a couple of implications. Are you building your business model around consolidation centers and trying to manage waste and whatever? Or are you trying your business model around managing the complexity to help mm -hmm. us filling that Absolutely. container utilization so that even if we were paying as an OEM $100 more for a container, it's 40% more utilized. Guess what we would decide? because the decision principles need to be anticipated and shared with the partners. They need to comprehend as well that we are sourcing based on total landed cost and not on a rate. And so far, stepping up to that challenge, understanding who of the two partners of the art industry and the logistics industry, so to say, who of us ought to be doing what to get to that result, because that this result must be achieved should not be a question. Yeah, but isn't the problem that what will happen is, do you want the container that's cheaper, the container that's most expensive, become the cheaper one? And it just stops there because you don't have this discussion, that you don't share it. Even the shipper themselves, uh, the shipping line, won't think it through. And, and you know, it's one of these things we have in these kinds of discussions. We have great ideas, um, great thinking, and then we'll go back on Monday and say, oh, this plant's, going to, this plant's going to close if we don't get this sorted out. And that's what we focus on. Yeah, and you know what? We, we just discussed how did Kodak die or mm. whoever else in that world that was presented yesterday. Yeah. Um, it was not stepping up to a challenge. I tell you what, if you have, I don't know, if there is, well, let's stick with that example. Mm. You, have an, you have a function that is consolidating, that is straight forwarding, that is managing your material in your region of origin to various destinations, right? 
Now, um, um, if, your, if your business model is around managing complexity and brain power to help achieving that saving that in the end will help you know, selling more cars to the degree that there is a price sensitivity at the end customer, then I guess that can generate a win-win. If you are not stepping up to the challenge, and if we are in agreement that nonetheless the results has to be achieved, others will do it for you. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do you want to? Yes, just to, uh, uh, one more word, uh, Louis. Uh, with all our suppliers, we're working, and I believe my colleague from Renault told that in the Mozokuri way. That means bring all together around the table and, and, and share the benefits. I believe that we're now, with our supplier, able to do that also. Mm -hmm. That's maybe an answer to your question also. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a change in mind we all experienced, I mean, the same in, uh, in, uh, in GM and uh, we, we, it's finished this kind of, uh, let's say, part by part way of looking. We all squeeze what we could there. <laughs> you all mentioned uh, speed, speed of adaptation and innovation and, and sort of keeping up with these changes. Uh, in the opening session yesterday, uh, Thomas Cullen gave us the example of an Amazon warehouse where they have huge fleets of AGVs and, and mm. sort of maybe more advanced material handling technology than we might see in, in, in the automotive supply chain, let's say. And then this morning we had uh, Fraunhofer mm. giving us examples of drones and, and, and you know, Google Glasses and smart Kanban and all that kind of stuff. Um, does, is the automotive industry, it seems to have... Uh, it seems to be slower to adapt to these technologies in some ways. It, might, it seems to, to analysts, anyhow, and do you agree? Do you think that, uh, should an automotive be one of the first to adapt these sorts of, uh, these sort of innovations? Why does it seem to be following rather than leading that? If I can answer that a little bit. Uh, I, think, I think in general in automotive, uh, um, I think you, you need to do the, the right investment. Hmm. Uh, because... Uh, um, it's like sourcing. In my opinion, it's not about insourcing or outsourcing or for sourcing. It is right sourcing. Uh, and and I, th I think also for these kind of investments, uh, what I can see is that uh, some, uh, we have a problem not uh, to, uh, to, uh, to apply these new technologies, uh, but uh, our problem is sometimes that we are over-investing mm -hmm. for application that, is, that has not a need so I think it's, it's again uh, you, you have uh, you have a, a process to handle. You need a, a certain uh, uh, technical solution. Of course, you go for the most simple solution that is possible, and 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 still be very efficient and effective. Um, that is one thing I think. Eh? But uh, but uh, of course, when it is uh, when we see the uh, the advantage, uh, I do not think uh, because also that was also one of the issues about yeah. We cannot uh, have uh, the money for new projects or, or investments and so on. I, I think I have never seen any from finance who said no to a, a project that has a short term uh, on, on short term on return on investment. I mean, if you have a good project and, and you have a six months uh, or three months uh, return on your investment, I mean, who, who will say no to that project? Eh? But they won't say yes to a two-year return. That's an, uh, that's an, that's of course, and, and that is uh, there we need there we have of course and. Uh, and, uh, a discussion about yeah, is it is a business case or not, or is it a strategic issue or not? But I don't think that is a, uh, that we are slower in terms of, of uh, applying new technology. It's more uh, on, a, on a need to base and, and just to, to see to that we do the right investment for the right uh, need. But is one of the advantages the Amazons and so on have got is that they're they're new? But you mentioned it as Kia. Uh, you came in and you didn't have a kind of history or hierarchy already in place, mm. Mm. so you could start afresh. So that gives the new, any new company, especially a new technology company, an advantage, which makes me think that, makes me think that if I was going to start, I don't know, a, a new car maker called Louis, you know, Louis car maker based in Cyprus, you know, I can even imagine the models, the Louis handsome and the Louis sexy, you know, and so on. <laughs> and I was going to hire you as, a, as logistics directors, uh, obviously, I wouldn't, but if, <laughs> we <are expensive>. <laughs> <laughs> if I was, and you had no, no kind of, nothing in place already in infrastructure, 
What would be the one thing or the two things that you wish you never had or that you could do completely different because you didn't have to worry about the legacy that you've already got in place? That's to either of you, but especially Andreas. <laughs> <laughs> I would ask for a salary increase for the pay to <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I would like to do it right from the very beginning mm -hmm. in the sense of um, comprehending who in that value chain has to do and owns which responsibility. Would like to ensure that the interfaces are properly understood and would like to make sure that we all share a common mindset and an openness to be innovative. Reason I'm saying it along that path is again, um, we gotta have an integrated internal and external partner stakeholder um, alignment as to what are the expectations and who of these stakeholders has to fulfill, who owns what role, who is, for example, if I stick with my famous example a few minutes ago, who owns to generate that schedule? What is, the, what is the variables of the functions that drive my performance into logistics? And let's assume for a minute it is, it is, uh, it is space at the receiving site, it is, um, it is a packaging that is stackable, and I do have a plan from the beginning that allows me to utilize all containers I have to a full extent. Well, I would entirely decline that function into who owns what of that function. I see volatility, I see quality holds, I see technical constraints as restrictions to an OR function. But the target function remains unchanged and I would, us, I would like us to be synchronized on maximizing the target function and managing the constraints. Mm -hmm. hmm. Hmm. Well, in my opinion, first, a very quick remark to your question, Christopher. Uh, uh, I think uh, manufacturers, they have um, a lot of technology that we are not applying at this moment of time. So we have just, mm. you know, under the table. So it is ready to go. Actually, when, first of all, when the market is mature enough to, to, to get the, the technology in, and, and also when the business case, I totally agree, it is positive. So because sometimes we react to legislation, so there is, a, I don't know, um, a tire pressure monitoring system legislation that say 100% and then suddenly all manufacturers have the technology already, already there and it's in a very short period of time it is already there. So the thing is that uh, here we, we have with the willingness to pay of, of customers. So uh, are the technology that we are putting into the vehicles is someone you know uh, keen to pay for it and how much are you paying for it? So. Um, and one of the, the, the very good examples here is electric vehicles. So each one of, of, of us will lose money when, whenever it is, we're producing electric vehicles because there is no m critical mass of vehicles. So it is, if we were producing two million of electric vehicles per year, then your cost goes, goes down. At, at, at this moment of time, it's, it's just an investment. So you need to start with, with something. Um, I think the technology will come, and the R&D centers, they are prepared with a lot of new things, but the, the, they will be getting into the market at a certain pace. So basically not overloading on, on that. So starting and, and answering your question, starting from, from a clean uh, piece of paper uh, gives you the, the, the possibility to rethink how things are done. I mean, um, in our case, when, when you enter a new market or you enter, a, a, let's say, you start a new business, basically you want to get uh, you want to get the best specialist in each of the areas. So normally there is sometimes a one unique single supplier of a certain thing that is not the best solution. So um, I am a truly believer to, to as, as we all were saying before, to have a, a partnership of, with a long-term relationship with, with, with our partners. So you, they, you need to be, needs to be a, a, a journey that we make together. So you need to find the right people and the right expertise in order to, to, to structure uh, your business in a way that will be profitable in the near future for both parts. Mm -hmm. So I, I think is uh, you know, finding the right partners in the, in, you know, in the different aspects of the supply chain, it is probably the most difficult part of, of, of creating all this from zero. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and the last point for you, Louis, is that if you want to make something really different it must be visible from the client. Mm -hmm. A perception like Amazon, which mm -hmm. challenges. And to this extent, of course, you're in using drone in the, in the warehouse is interesting, but it's visible for your 
pocket as an OEM, not visible for the, the client. So maybe you can work on that in Cyprus. <laughs> <laughs> you all have um, changing or evolving situations with, with so let's say, your logistics management, where obviously Volvo created a kind of in-house logistics team from two years ago. PSA sold 75% of Jeffco and has a contract. GM gained Jeffco with the contract. <laughs> Glovis is Glovis and has acquired, or is acquiring, control of a company with assets. What, what would you sort of say strategically you want from those dynamics, those relationships now, for you, for Glovis with assets now, for you from Jeffco, for mm -hmm. Volvo in-house, and, and for you, Jeffco? I mean, we, we all know that, that the circumstances are different in each, but what's the strategic uh, expectation that you have? Who wants to start? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, we, we and Volvo, we have, uh, we have insourced uh, both uh, inbound and, and outbound, and customers also uh, uh, one or two years ago. And, and, uh, and I must say, it uh, uh, has been an interesting journey. First of all, it was a big challenge uh, to, to do that uh, during operations, uh, uh, including over the, taking over the whole uh, packaging pool ourselves. So um, it was very challenging. We have done it with limited resources and a very tight, uh, uh, tight, uh, tight uh, time frame. Um, we have seen major advantages, uh, uh, and in particular in the, um, uh, in the way we can uh, make uh, the contracting ourselves. It gives uh, us a much better uh, understanding how we can optimize uh, from a sourcing point of view. Um, and, and secondly, uh, uh, we also see the benefit that we now have uh, much better uh, visibility and, and data that we can use uh, together with the supply chain coordination, uh, production, uh, marketing and sales. So for me, it, uh, it, is, a, it is a key enabler to, to have that, uh, the, the management of your, uh, of your flow and your, of your value chain that you have that in-house. In I think it's, it's too important and especially when we see the development of cars in the future, we never know what car we will have. But, but, but I think the, if, uh, the value chain uh, management is, is a key uh, asset uh, for future development of our company. So we, we have seen uh, major advantages, I would say, from both from a cost point of view, but also from an uh, internal cooperation point of view, uh, major. Well, in, in my opinion, for, for, for us, um, Globis is a key partner in, in our business. I mean, it's basically the a previous situation was that it was a decentralized, so every, every subsidiary was doing basically their own decisions in terms of uh, um, ten, compound tenders and log uh, secondary transportation and, and all of that. So the, the other value that Globis gave us, what, uh, you know, they, they, they are the really experts on the, on the supply chain, on the logistics, on, on, on Europe. We as clients, we know much, much less on the operatives and the, that they do. And what we are doing now, it is a merge of, of, of uh, uh, having one single point of contact if, in Europe for a lot of all the activity that is happening you know, in the logistics and supply chain area in Europe. So when there is, when there is uh, tenders in each of the markets, they need to coordinate, they, they can get best practices from one market to the other, but at the same time, they could use one provider in one place and also they could be with the same provider in another country uh, that they could you know, leverage and say the, the level of service and, and um, let's say, and quality of, of the certain KPIs and agreements in, in, in different parts. So basically that common and centralized strategy of, of logistics in Europe for us is bringing a lot, a lot of added value. Well, uh, on our side, I mean, um, the, 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 the major point is to integrate, okay, Logistic is, of course, a cost. We know all that, and it's always a, a drastic cost. And awful, I mean, just to think about <laughs> Well, okay, the, the, the ones that said, um, you have to put that in a more global vision, and uh, you think that uh, cost is, yes, it's here, but also to gain some revenue, if you're flexible enough, to gain, the, let's say, uh, some... Uh, confidence of the dealers on, uh, to, to, to cope the last car and to, it's a tool to reduce uh, inventory and cash and this costs a lot. Mm -hmm. 
working with one, uh, let's say, uh, LSP, which is our case, and uh, everybody knows, okay, it can be seen as a, uh, as a nightmare for, uh, but it's also an opportunity to think globally the architecture of our logistic network. So, we'll have all, uh, with our history, our priority to, to deal with. Uh, ours is maybe more concerned now on supply chain management. Maybe we'll look at some uh, elements of logistics and, uh, and basic cost optimization a bit afterwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm dreaming too, and we have wishes as well. <laughs> no, the, the um, I, you know, I guess there is, there is a, if you, if you, if you were breaking out the operations you're running into a plan and execute a check and feeding back of lessons learned, and you're calling your doing activities, or to say the standard type of sourcing and operating of what you've contracted, then I guess there is a various amount of planning functions that is absolutely a core function within a company because you need to synchronize the various functions within an OEM around manufacturing, engineering, purchasing, and supply chain cost. You know, I guess one of the examples that, is, that we discussed yesterday was around um, say it's the design of an exhaust system. Has, has an impact on logistics, has an impact on how you manufacture, has an impact on engineering, has, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, planning that kind of uh, activities, integrating, orchestrating the various parties within a company, and, um, and uh, running and taking and managing that value chain is clearly a function that we, that we see as absolute core, and that we see as um, stepping up to a future of really managing the value chain. Mm. Now, in terms of um, uh, the various ideas that you are generating, that we are currently executing, that we are implementing as I speak, or that we have just implemented, I guess two or three we talked yesterday. One was order slotting, where we had received the award from the, from the uh, VDA a couple of days ago, where we are anticipating into uh, the buildability of our schedules, some material and the material restrictions, for example, on an ocean flow into our build schedules. Or the powertrain synchronization to reduce the volatility and to synchronize the inventories across an assembly and a powertrain plant. Or the uh, schedule conversion by stopping just sending, you know, production demands uh, of a 40-year-old mainframe system out to the supply base, rather than converting a schedule that we would communicate to the transportation environment so that it receives a good schedule. Um, these are all things we're doing. Part of that idea is, or has been, that has driven us to uh, run that 4PL concept via Jeffco was, that we said, um, so there must be an opportunity to engineer networks and to leverage volume and scale across a GM book of business with a party that is a crown logistics provider and you know, must have expertise from people and from, from, uh, from, a, from a tool perspective. So that was the driving thought behind that. And um, um, I guess that that directly links to one of the discussion points yesterday where, that I at least observed here where I um, can't remember who it was, said, why don't you rely on the, uh, uh, should it be the OEM? Should it be the individual 3PL at a moment of sourcing to design the networks? And our thinking process, our thoughts were, well, it could be an integrator in between that would not only sort of say support or engineer a network on a one-to-one -one relation to a plant, to an opal plant, but as well um, across all opal plants on a, on a macro level, and then again on a meta level across a GM book of business. So that was a driving thought behind it. Okay. Thank you. I'm aware that it has to, has to get going. So I guess if there is a question, we would put it now and let you go on. So is there any question specifically at this moment for, for Git? Otherwise, we will have to, we'll, we will say goodbye, I guess, both. <laughs> No. Okay. Well, then I, I don't okay. want to thank you. Thank you for your participation. Okay. And, uh, Continue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Job. Same. Bye. Thank you very much. Any questions for anybody else in the meantime? Thank you very much. Yeah.
clearly not the Kita for us. <laughs> I was kind of, you know, looking at the three PLs out there again, uh, being the entrepreneur that I am, as well as having a car maker, I'm also <laughs> going to build a new logistics company. I'm going to invite one of you guys to be the head of the logistics company. <laughs> what would you do if you became the head of a logistics provider? Okay, specifically, we're looking at automotive logistics. So what would you do as a major strategy to support the automotive logistics industry Bearing in mind the restraints that they're under from these horrible guys at the car makers. Um, so what would be your plans and what would you do to, to build that, to support the automotive industry? Three things. Mm -hmm. I would go knocking the door, present my innovations, my intelligence and my capabilities between tenders and not trying to convince at a tender. Mm -hmm. The second thing I would do is I would, um, I would organize myself so that I can bridge a communication gap and help leveraging the expectations on both sides. My example yesterday was, if you are sending a rocket to the moon, but the guy you're talking to doesn't even know when the moon exists, you know, I live in a small village here. Right? <laughs> yeah. You know, then you have a communication problem, so yeah. bridge the gap. And the third thing I would do is, I would absolutely make clear that I'm ready to step up and manage the complexity, and here is what I can demonstrate in terms of I fully utilize your conveyances, I have the perfect network for you, and um, this is why I'm offering this and that price. These are the three things I would do from a technology, communication, and uh, mindset perspective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He knew the question before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he really want to, to work in Cyprus. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> but any other thoughts from you guys? And, and let me throw it out as well. I mean, you are the people who are doing it. In a way, what, uh, what Andreas just said is almost common sense. Mm. So why was it presented as if you guys don't do it? Mm. Is there anyone who's got to say, yeah, we've tried doing that, but, <laughs> or whatever. Is there any comments from anyone from the 3PL side? Or anyone wants to hire Andreas? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not that, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> no. Okay. But uh, for, for Guy and, and for Carlos, do you, do you Obviously, as Louis read right between the lines, uh, as Andreas indicated, that only real responses seem to come at times of tender or, or, yeah. or quotes and not in between. Is, is this an experience you find as well in, in, in your supply chains and also in your experience even beyond outbound? Yes, be it on outbound and inbound, the situation is quite different for us yeah. since uh, we, we, we save a lot of time in, uh, in tender um, since we're working with... Uh, with Jeffco, so in fact we are rather more in a in a continuous improvement business. That means that we have, uh, let's say, uh, we, we don't stick to any particular tenders. We, we share our midterm plan, and uh, we look already how to optimize the global uh, the global design of our uh, inbound, outbound, and uh, and try to get the best uh, solution. So, could be a yes. Something, as you mentioned, that uh, that really to, to to be very close to the the process of your of your client, Louis, mm -hmm. if you want to to get uh, this one, I mean, of mm -hmm. course, uh, Andreas. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's very really, it's very important to to understand what is the other part needs, what, what, what is basically the the the, the objective you, that you want to achieve, because many. Many of the tenders that you put in place, you, you already have certain ideas preconceived. You know, so you, you really already are limiting you know, quite a lot the, the, the space of, 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 of working in that direction. And many times, um, if you make a very, very open tender, then the, the possibility of comparison between, between the offers you know, implies that you need to to have different routes, you, you, you need to have, uh, in, many, in many cases, in order for a route to be competitive, then you need to find the flow back 
from that route in the other direction and many times the, the, you need to find flows <coughs> from from other competitors but only the, the um, uh, logistic company who's, who's uh, proposing that is the only one who knows you know that he can give you that price because the flow that he's going to get on the contrary is, is already confirmed but if on the other part the flow is not yet confirmed and is already a tender there is a multi t mm -hmm. a, a multi tender com comparisons where where basically the complexity gets uh, very very um, uh, you know it's, it, it increases quite a lot so um, basically you need to try to uh, in our opinion you need to listen to 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 uh, to the logistics companies and the, and the, you know, our partners in order to understand, you know, first of all, this is our idea, but um, please think out of the box, please propose th new things. And um, even if a tender, of course, it has a certain boundaries that you need to, to, to maintain, um, we're also happy to listen for, for, for alternatives, for, for new ideas, for new, new ways of, of, uh, of structuring our, our uh, flows, supply chain. In an ideal world, if, you know, here I am selling a car to a customer. He's excited about his car. He wants to have the best value for the price he's paying. And I'm telling him, I will deliver you my car, your car, on the 31st of March, and you definitely have the best price, um, the best value for the price you can get. And my expectation is, that all of us helps this customer to be satisfied and, if at all, to be enthusiastic um, um, about us, worst case, being in a position to deliver that car on the 31st of March and not having an outbound distribution that takes me five days while it's an inbound I'm measuring 15 minutes. Second thing is, I want to make sure that my containers were so well utilized, and I'm again with that example, <laughs> that I do not have to ship 800 million or whatever we said, or 2 billion we said earlier, and on, on waste through the, through, through the globe, and then having to tell the customer, you know, it's 200 euros more expensive because we are shipping waste. Um, I would like him to spend this 200 euros on having a nice dinner with his family, right? And I want us to be on board and manage these 49 shades of gray and manage the complexity and achieve jointly and together satisfied customers that get the best value for the price they're paying mm -hmm. in time. Mm -hmm. Anybody awake out there? There we are. Mike in the Question front. At the front. Yeah. <coughs> In your new business, Louis, <laughs> gentlemen, the questions, the gentlemen in the floor, <clears throat> would you still continue to organise in a new logistics business your inbound, your outbound, and your aftermarket in the way it is we see common today, or would you matrix this in a regional setup? Interesting question. I mean, what I would obviously do is hire the experts like these three. <laughs> so the question goes over. I mean, in a way, you're separate. You know, you've kind of got inbound and outbound. Guy, although you've worked in inbound, you're now primarily on outbound. Uh, Carlos is, is kind of, again, primarily on the, on the outbound side. You know, the ways of how much integration ideally should there be. Um, so, you know, the question... I, I is think it's... it's uh, there is... Again, it's, um, it's not a question of nature, it's a question of degree, it is what are you doing where. Um, if, I want to, if I want to have a global ocean bed, so I would probably go running a global ocean bed to see, to as well provide the opportunity to my supplier base to come up with potentials to combine flows to engineer networks. Um, if I'm running a, uh, an, an inland sourcing for my plant in Rüsselsheim, I would probably not ask a truck provider, and now I'm being a bit cynical, in, uh, in India to quote. Um, in so far, from a commercial perspective and from an engineering perspective, um, I would like to obtain intelligence and knowledge prior to tenders from our supply base as to what makes more sense. In principle terms, I would rather think that uh, where I can leverage global volumes and engineer networks on a more global scale, I would go for a globalized um, 
sourcing process on uh, in, in aspects where it makes you know, more sense to be regional, I would go regional. On the operational instance, I would always be very local, and I guess that might be where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, you've got to control it where you are receiving your parts. Mm -hmm. And maybe one more aspect that I think is of crucial importance. Um, I think um, we've got to step up together on manage from where we send, so that what we are sending is optimized. You know, one of the examples I saw yesterday, or we discussed in a, what, what, what session was it again? We talked scanning. It was about RFID on the vehicle outbound side. And uh, later on, we choked, Luis and me choked, and I said, well, on the vehicle outbound side, we are now, 2015, discussing RFID and scanning of every individual part, or eventually the trucks that leaves, as it leaves the, the yard. Um, on the warehouse side, on the inbound side, we are, we are discussing a reduction of scanning of a pallet to avoid the cost associated with that work. And one of the ways of doing that is you can do a scanning at receiving, and by the way, you can do it at picking. And if we can ensure that the flow and what is being packed is coming through the way it was intended to come through, then here's where your savings are. And I guess this is where we need to step up to be smart about what it is that we really, that we really want to control and that we ought to be managing. <clears throat> <clears throat> and maybe to try to answer to your question, you have to think about operational process and management. Are, are the same people managing the outbound, the inbound? Is it the same kind of clients? Do they work the same tack time? Not that true. So you really, to be efficient, need to be, I mean, I, I believe more in uh, trying to find a, a colleague just beneath me to say, hey, we're having inbound flows, you're having inbound flows. An inbound flow is an inbound flow. Nearly the same for each and everybody. And try to find the best solution to optimize this kind of flow, rather to optimize for me inbound and outbound. But this is also something, somewhere, a place where, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Andreas, where we are, we are very willing to, 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 to have the new, uh, the, the new free PL Louis uh, Inc., uh, who could uh, bring us visibility. Yes, of course, with a, a, a bunch of, uh, of uncertainty because of tenders and things like that, but to give us visibility on that and say, okay. We're having a flow for you. This is another flow for another guy. And we can maybe optimize. Just tell us. Carlos, before you come to the next point, I, I'd like to take this ball too. Um, uh, because it was the other discussion point yesterday. I would have liked to say something when it was discussed. <laughs> it was about um, you combining, <laughs> combining inbound and outbound. Okay? At the customer side, and stay tuned on this one. Okay? Change is coming. Um, we, where we try to comprehend that there is opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to, um, to engineer eventually both. But the challenge here is that it coincides with a number of other aspects that as a OEM and as a, um, as a service provider, uh, we will have to do. One of them being we need to synchronize the schedule and the volatility on the material inbound with the vehicle distribution. As a matter of fact, many markets, so to say, are distributing more cars towards the end of the months rather than at the beginning of the months. Your inbound flow, however, is, if at all, Linear. stabilized or mm -hmm. vice versa. Yeah. So uh, there is much more behind um, synchronizing these uh, activities to enable that you can really leverage that uh, technical concept that is out there. Mm. And this is why we said yesterday, maybe a bit academic, and <coughs> in, 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 in when, we, when we brought that message forward, it is not and never about just simply presenting a technology or a capability if it does not coincide with the capability to adjust process and organization. Mm. Also, you know, you cannot, it is not, it is never one of them. It is always going together. Mm. Basically, <coughs> I agree with with, with uh, both point of views. I mean, in, in my opinion, I mean, we're fully concentrated on the outbound uh, activities. Um, so I, I, I do not have uh, a strong opinion on the inbound, uh, let's say, uh, the 
casuistic, you know, the, the problems that they are there. But I, um, I agree with you, it's, for, for us it's, it's important to get efficiency on maximizing that independently the inbounds could be mm -hmm basically uh, be more efficient with the combination of all the other inbounds and also <coughs> the same on the outbound. So treating them like maximizing efficiency in each of, of the areas independently. Uh, if there is a way of, of streamline, you know, and, and have um, a, a, a much uh, lean process combining both, um, I guess also complexity, you know, will, will also increase quite a lot. You never know, you know, if if that is going to be more efficient, that looking, you know, independently, and what you were saying, in, in many cases, you need to be very, very local. In some of them, you need to have a broader look. So I, I, I would say that um, uh, I would treat at least differently the, 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 the efficiency in each of the, mm -hmm. of the areas. But of course, in the inbound, we are, I'm not an expert. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Guy, in, in your very job title, I think it's uh, you know stock management or <laughs> stock reduction. Um, and now, is that for you really just outbound though, or really just vehicle logistics? Doesn't doesn't a lot of that strategy go beyond that, or or, or you know whether it's forecasting or? Yes, yeah. of course, it's uh, it's uh, all, all kind of uh, inventory with parts, uh, spare parts, and uh, and things like that, and. Uh, and there to, to, to bridge the, let's say, the gap between this uh, kind of uh, daily production, uh, uh, pull, pushing a lot of cars, and, uh, and as you mentioned, an and, and end of the month, uh, how do you call that, uh, let's say, uh, increase. Uh, I mean, all this is, this is, in fact, our tuning that helps to to, to uh, of course decrease the cost, but also the inventory. So you really have to to integrate, and, and I believe that each company has uh, its own DNA on that. Some of them are very quick to answer. The other one may be lower, but with lower inventory in terms of parts, higher in terms of vehicles. This is something that uh, you have to 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 integrate in a global system and. Um, each has its own uh, way of thinking. Yeah. The important point is that, as I mentioned yesterday, it must be an agreed flexibility from the sales department until the supplier. And it's challenged that. Yeah. In my opinion, the, um, many times it is too much focused on, on the uh, month of sales in the stock management, in the in mm. inventory management. I mean, for us, um, we, we did uh, last year uh, an optimal stock strategy in order to balance and say, mm. you know, what markets they need to have, how many months, and, and, and um, looking at seasonalities and etc. All, all kind of, of variables. Um, for us, it's very important the rotation that we give because we, we, we you could have a compound with two months of stock in, in, in your NSC and could be less inefficient if you, you take it there and you rotate it, you know, in a, in a, in a very inefficient way. Mm -hmm. I mean, if the car goes in and then, you know, goes out on a, on a continuous process, that means that your sales are continuously fed by the right mm -hmm. mix of cars. So what, what, what it is important it is to try to adapt to the peaks of the end of the month because it happened, um, and at the same time have that flexibility of being able to m make a modular uh, adjustment in your stocks whenever you need, because the, the first priority is not to lose sales. Yep. So basically, this is a tool in order to sell cars. You have very low inventory, your cost reduces a lot, but then you're losing sales opportunity. So you need to have the balance between a, a, an acceptable cost of inven in, for inventory and, and at the same time being able to, to achieve your sales targets. It is it's the, the key for us. Just a, a question for the audience, really. Um, I don't think I have to convince anybody that I'm not that bright. But one of the things, in, or the things that the panel have said today, a lot of the things that they'd like to see happen, what they would do if they were CEOs of car makers or logistics companies or whatever it is, seem to me like common sense. Um, so to you guys out there, and I'd like to see like a raise, you know, a, you know, a show of hands. How many people think that? a good percentage of what we've heard should be done or what, you know, what is being done, what percentage of you actually think 
That's what is being done. So I don't know if anyone could raise a hand and say, you know what the things that you're saying about, you know, not, not, um, not just uh, trying to sell or show your innovations at tender time, you know, but this kind of stuff. How much of that kind of stuff is actually being done, do you feel? Okay, I mean, it seems a relatively low percentage. So, you know, I guess the question back to the panel, and again, unfortunately, Andreas, because you raised some of these points, why not? You were asking me, or are you asking the audience? <laughs> well, I'm asking you because I've got a feeling no, uh, that they would say, yeah, and I suppose it's, it's just whichever side of the fence you're on. I've got a feeling that many of them would say, yeah, the car makers say that, but when we try to do it. You know, so, you know again, again, it is, it is a, um, it is a, you know, it is not a matter of nature. It's a, it's a question of decree. It's the decrees that I'm talking to, I mean, so there is, so there is huge intelligence out there in that industry. There is huge innovation out there, and I'm not saying that you put honey around anybody's mouth. I mean, you know me well enough. Mm -hmm. um, um, however, there is an increasing... The, the world around us is changing at a relatively rapid speed, and I'm not sure if that decree is a little bit faster than the decree to what that we are having in that industry that is stepping up to these changes. I see a huge impatience. I was, you know, you are working on your mobile phone or smartphone or whatever these things are, and you get instant responses. You have, um, you get instant responses, and then you are getting. You have to convince the same people that are used to that type of an environment, and uh, that well, it takes you five cars to, uh, to five days to deliver a car from A to B. Um, you have all the smart things. We are flying to the moon, but we are not utilizing a container to 100% at any point in time. <laughs> we, are, um, we, are, you know, we are doing many fancy things out there, but um, so deliver reliability um, to the final customer, and there's, you know, it's not 100%. And there is churn that is creating that. Um, the question is, are we stepping up to really manage that churn at any point of time, or are we complaining of its existence? Um, most people I know in that industry are comprehending that this churn and that waste and that challenge that is out there is our reason for being, and this is why they offer ways to manage it. But the question is, are we doing it good enough? Are we keeping up the pace? Are we winning that race of time? Are we comprehending that there is no other option than to want to win that race? And that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Maybe one, one more word. I, um, we, we, we all know, be it uh, 3PL and OEM, that when we build one day a solution, uh, at the end of the day we say, boff, it's not that good. <laughs> and uh, what is not very well working together is to share the fact that during the next years we'll have room for improvement and share this improvement. I believe that we'll be able to, to save a lot of money and try to avoid collectively the Kodak uh, mm -hmm. thing once we'll be able to, to work together in a style of mid-term uh, enhancement plan. I mean, we, we're, we, we're all trying to get some perfection from the OEM side, the LSP, it's for sure. But we're not that good to share the, our drawbacks and the way of working together. So maybe that's uh, not at, at the tender, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. but right out of the tender, say, OK, that was our proposition. Mm -hmm. Now we have this, 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 this idea to go a step further. And a lot of steps are possible. Okay, I mean, I think we're... Oh, sorry, a question from the young gentleman. My name is Monatak, you're just from UTI. Okay, uh, we're just getting the microphone, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Monatak, you're just from UTI. I would like to ask a question that in the RFQ process, normally it's given number of lanes and number of containers and it's asked to code for these. But there is no window for being innovative in that. You just need to go for the shipping line and put down the numbers. In the RFQ process, will that be possible for you to share 
more details, like we have certain volume, and if you can manage it instead of 1,000 containers with 800 containers, then it will be our capability. So do you believe we can change the game in terms of RFQ structure? Nowadays, RFQs are run by uh, third-party companies. You just put down the numbers in the portal, and they are evaluated based on the numbers. So there is nothing being innovative scope mm -hmm. there. That's what I feel. Would you agree? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is why I'm saying that comprehending the requirements for ex or comprehending a customer need, for example, around total landed cost, one very concrete example you're asking, um, and offering a capability that will help us, for example, um, through a better engineered network that you might be able to offer, or through a better utilization of the conveyance that you're offering, or, or, or. Um, so uh, if, if, if this is what you were able to bring to the party, you should be presenting that, you should be making that clear. At the point of tender, I agree, this is too late, because at the point of tender, it is all about collecting a rate. But then it is about comprehending that if you are offering a rate of, I don't know, $1,000 versus that 60% uh, utilized container and a rate of $950 versus a 90% utilized container, if you want to give that guarantee, I give you my guarantee that you will win that deal. Okay, well I think uh, we've uh, we finished the time for the panel. So firstly I'd like to, to thank the panel for their great and honest answers. Thank you very much. So before I close the, uh, the conference, firstly, uh, the evaluation forms. These are very important to us, you know, more than ever in Europe. It's a conference that's been going for over 10 years, so we really value your thoughts and opinions on what we can do to make sure it remains or, or, or grows and improves to become the, the conference that this industry uh, deserves. So please complete your evaluation forms. Uh, put your hands in the air with the forms and any ones that are positive and say good things about me will collect and, uh, and put them in for a, for a prize draw. Um, I'd like to also take this opportunity to, uh, to thank our sponsors uh, for their support. My family and I would really do really appreciate your support, so thank you very much to our gold sponsors, CHEP, DSV, Evolution, Jeffco, KHS, Priority Freight and Sovereign. Our global sponsors, CTM Law and Willanius Wilhelmsen, and our uh, silver sponsors, ARS Altman, BLG, Evolves Cargo Care, FedEx, Flexis, Geodis, Goodpack, Inform, Orbis, Proax, Swiss Post, TNT, and UTI. They sponsor the conference not just to support my family's education, but also because they provide services, knowledge, people to help you in your industry, in this sector, in this region. So if you haven't had a chance to visit their stands, visit their, uh, visit their websites, collect their literature, read their information in the programme, uh, and I'm sure you'll find it uh, very valuable to, uh, to see what, the, what they've got to offer. Uh, we'll do, I think we'll do the, very, the, the prize draw now. If you haven't had the time, we still want your, um, your uh, evaluation forms, but we'll do this now quickly. Uh, and then any of the other valuation forms, please pass them on to us as soon as you can. There is a, uh, a prize at the end. You'll get a CD collection of all my jokes from the last 10 years. <laughs> what do you mean you want your forms back? Halbrich <laughs> uh, from Inform. So is he still in the room? Oh, fantastic, excellent. So please find a beautiful carrier bag. Uh, I'll keep the, the stuff that's inside. <laughs> but thank you very much for your, your thank support. You very much, Louis. Thank you. Okay. So. Thanks a lot. And just a, a, a few remarks uh, on, the, on the industry and on the conference. Um, I think, firstly, you know, hopefully you've had some interesting conversations and, and networking, heard some interesting sessions. 
We tried to shake things up a little bit by looking a bit more futuristically, you know, beyond automotive logistics, um, looking at what the future of the industry is going to look like. We can be a little bit reactive uh, at times, but I think it was good to see what the industry is going to look like, the positive outlook, the, the global growth that's happening. Um, I thought some of the, you know, I thought Chris Bangle was great last night. Those who made it to the gala dinner, very inspirational. On the one hand, the other side of it, of course, is it reminded us sometimes perhaps in, we're, in logistics where the victims were always controlled by costs and those pesky purchasing people. But it's interesting, you know, when you think of the fancy dans in design who can get whatever they want because they're on the design side. It was, as much as it was inspirational, it was also interesting to see his, the goalposts that he had to work within and the restrictions that he has. So it, it, was, you know, so it was interesting to see that, that it's not just logistics where costs are, are very involved. So I thought that was a very interesting presentation. But I'd also like to highlight you know, the positive side. One of my big things is you know, the, the, the things that the, the, the group, the, the panel were talking about that they'd like implemented. To be, you know, they want these things implemented, you want these things implemented, but one of the things we need to do is, one of the first things that I would do at, you know, Louis Car Manufacturing or whatever, would probably have logistics and for sure supply chain on the board. Not reporting to purchasing or not reporting to manufacturing, but on the board, because what you do is such an important role. It's a huge amount of money that's spent on logistics. A lot more is spent on logistics than some other, what are considered to be, uh, the glamorous or the important functions or the things that you think as car makers, you know, logistics is only so good if you make great cars. Of course, that's true. But um, a lot of money is spent on logistics. So just from a monetary point of view, logistics is really important. And we need to keep getting that message out to the very highest levels. Perhaps just changing our lexicon, changing the words that we use. You know, waste reduction is not waste reduction. It's a contribution to profit. Global logistics costs are actually enabling global trade. Vehicle logistics and service parts logistics is optimizing customer satisfaction. Lean inventory, efficient vehicle logistics is cash flow improvement, cash flow maximization. That's the message we need to get across. Not when in our own forums we say logistics is a cost. Waste elimination, words like that. We've got to remind people that what we do is a very, very important positive contribution to the global automotive industry. Without us, it's impossible. They can show off about the new markets that they're going into, how profitable China is. But try doing that without good logistics. Try having global sourcing, low-cost sourcing, right-cost sourcing, whatever it's called now, without good logistics. Try having you know, the, the new markets that you're sending your fantastic cars out to without good logistics. It's impossible. We need them, but sure as heck, they need us as well. And we should be very proud of that and try and just push that forward. We're not victims. We're, we're superstars in the automotive industry. So let's have that positive message and be proud of what you do. And I hope that, you know, that you, you can push that message upwards within your organisations. And, um, and then let me, I'm just trying to work out where I am now, March. So March is Europe. So if you, I hope we'll see you somewhere around the world in the future. Uh, we, we're not just conferences, we're an information flow company about logistics. What we've heard the last few days is logistics is as much about the flow of information as it is about the flow of materials or goods. So please interact with us. Keep us aware of what you're doing. You know, we all know Chris. Uh, Chris has got, uh, got a great team. Mark is on the newsletter and Rachel, the assistant editor. Make sure they're aware of what you're doing. Send us the news. Keep us uh, aware of what your company's doing and what you want to read. We're always looking for new ideas. Um, you know, most of you know me. And Nemish, who did a great job actually putting this conference together. Nemish Ladwa is uh, our international program manager. So any ideas for the conferences, anyone who wants to speak at the conferences, make Nemish aware. Uh, we've got a very average sales team. Now we've got a great sales team. So if you want to help us to promote your team, please turn to your account managers and business development managers to support what you do. And hopefully we'll see you around the world. How does it go now? April is China, uh, Shanghai this year. 
Uh, beginning of June is our finished vehicle logistics conference in Newport Beach, California. And in, if anybody who's seen the photo that I had from our previous gala dinner a couple of years ago won't need too much persuasion to attend there. Uh, end of June is our Automotive Logistics Russia conference in Moscow. In August, we have uh, an import-export conference in collaboration with AIAG in North America in the port of Baltimore. September is Automotive Logistics uh, Global in Detroit. Uh, October, we're honoured to be partners, or we, we support, or I suppose we power, the ECG uh, Vehicle Logistics Conference in Europe. November is South America in Sao Paulo. December is India. Uh, December the 25th, we have a day off. Uh, and then January, it's uh, Mexico. And then we start all over again. Uh, and we look forward to seeing all of you and more at Automotive Logistics Europe in 2016. But thank you very much for your wholehearted participation. And I hope you've had a great couple of days. Thank you very much.